that I've messaged but haven't met in person. I'm the Matt that you got the message from. Um, yeah, so we, I, my wife and I, Emily, lead the young adults at Glenridge and thought what a beautiful opportunity for us to, we young to, young to mid adults, whatever you want to call it, um, from churches across the city, all at an equip. Let's create an opportunity to get some wind into our sails, to get fired up, to have faith stirred in our hearts. And we've got an incredible, an incredible gift to NCMI um, over the years and just, yeah, absolute inspiration in Henny Cater. Um, and he has lived a life, yes, I actually don't really know Henny very well, but yes, his stories are like legend in NCMI. And um, not only that, it's not like it's a life that he lived radically for Jesus. He still lives radically for Jesus. And... Yeah, just hearing some of his stories and, well, hearing some of his history now, just very briefly before we started, it, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Sorry, it's getting a bit emotional. It's unbelievable how much it moves you. And we are all, I mean, there's been such a beautiful theme of, like, more than one person has said, young people, next generation, next generation leaders, churches planted through young people, young people, young people. And we, we are all called. We are all called. We all love Jesus. And so, yeah, we've got some questions. We're gonna, and Henny's going to tell us some stories. Um, but really open your hearts. Guys, this is such a beautiful moment for God to stir faith in your hearts. To, and I really pray that when we leave this, even just this moment, we are full of faith. We are ready to step into everything that God has for us. Any? Cool. Yeah. So should I, yeah, should I just start with that first question? Uh, Henny, before you start, actually, would you mind just introducing yourself yeah. and a little bit of your backstory? Well, we, uh, it's an absolute honor to be with you guys this afternoon and, uh, you know, uh, just to come at the tail end of what happened during the last day two, uh, to to uh, just listening to all of this, I, in my heart, I just felt that, you know, we've heard all the challenges, what God wants to do, uh, and I just trust that today, uh, God will just come and and somehow He's just gonna just confirm things about His call on your life. Um, you know, with Rita and myself, we, I'd love to share a little bit of that, especially for the younger generation, for you guys, um, how that God came through for us, um, for Rita and myself, how, the way I met her. But, uh, but here we are today. Uh, we've, uh, we've been in ministry. I came in in 1972, and uh, I... I can't do anything else but this. So uh, just to be able to represent the king and the kingdom, um, that, is, that to me, that's what, that really what it's all about. Um, but something of that we, uh, will come through this uh, afternoon that I'd like to share with you. So maybe just without wasting time, just to get straight in the, into those questions. So our first question is, what would you say to us as young people wanting to serve Jesus? Well, I think first of all, um, if we were to open our eyes in the spiritual, then we'll be able to see and understand what God can do through us. Um, and that is going to really determine, uh, depend on yourself. If we, we, can, de we can determine uh, where we're actually going to end. You know, and, and I've, I've remembered, always remembered this, that someone said to me, um, years ago, I went and studied theology, and uh, also one of the, your students at the time as well, and he said to me, Henny, it's not how you start, but how you finish. And it's always, it's always been there, and uh, so I, I like to just leave that with you. If you were to just open your eyes in the spiritual and see where God wants you to be, and where you can be actually in, in God, um, and you want, you just look at yourself and say, right, 
in five years' time, in ten years' time, where am I actually, you know, where do you see yourself? And so uh, the other day, uh, Stan came, and he was with us in Port Shepston, and uh, he, uh, he shared something about, uh, you, know, you know, from Ephesians, uh, verse, all the verse tens, from chapter 1 to verse 6, chapter 6. And uh, in chapter 6, verse 10, it says, And finally, be strong in the Lord. And, uh, you know, when he said that, I immediately, I, I thought to myself, that it took me back to so many years ago where I, I, I um, it was like a crossroad in my life. Um, as a young person at the time, um, you know, we, we've all got ideas and things that we long for, long, we would long, long to achieve. And so I, I achieved everything I could in the sporting world. And uh, what happened was we, after I've achieved that, I, I was involved in mechanical engineering and I had one year to go before I finished my, you know, to, to become fully qualified. And it was at that point of time, now before then, I, I never had, you know, the, everything was in front of me, but I had to work for it. But the day God spoke to me and he said, you coming in full time into ministry, that was the day that everything just, I had so many offers. Um, the, the, the person that I worked with, uh, the chief engineer, he came and he said, Henny, if you just stay with us for one more year, you can do your final year in Germany. Uh, we will we'll give you a company. I had a company car, and you can go and choose the vehicle of your choice, and it, we can register it on your name, and we will, re, we will double your pension for you. So I, I thought, why didn't he come and tell me that a week before? But just the time where God really challenged me, and then from my family side, I had tremendous offers just to... to uh, that I could go into him, but I didn't. But I, I remember this, that I came, I came from work this one day, and uh, I was so confused. I said, God, I, I really just feel in my heart, this is the way for, and at that point of time, I've been in part-time ministry for about four years, but now God is calling me to go full-time. And I, I arrived at home, and I... I said, God, I'm desperate for you. Um, my whole life has been about you. I, I, wanted to, I want to just do what you want me to do. But I remember I knelt by the side of my bed, and I was broken. I started to cry. I said, God, please just help me with this. I don't want to make the wrong, the wrong, you know, the wrong, the wrong uh, decision here. And it was while I was busy praying, and I... I was just, I was into seeking God's face. I was deep into worship. And the next moment, while I was doing this, it was like the real me, not this body, but r the real me, it was like he wasn't in that body anymore. And I saw the real me leave this body. And the next moment, it was like I... I, res I arrived at a place which I couldn't describe. All I remember was, it was overwhelming. And, they, and this place was guarded. It was protected. There were two creatures standing there. And they were not, they were not like human beings. They were, they were like angelic beings. And they were standing there and they were protecting this. And no one could get in there. And as I arrived there, this one came and he said, what are you doing here? Why are you coming here? And what, how, why would we allow you to come in? And he said, and, and what is the password? How are you going to get in here? And all I remember was this. I said, it is the blood of Jesus. And when I started, when I mentioned that, it was like this gate started opening up and it was, it was all overwhelming. It was like gold. I started to walk on this in, inside and the street was 
it was it was all paved out, and on the side of the of this of the of this road, they were gems, precious stones. The whole thing was lined out on both sides. It was overwhelming. I read about that later on about the, all the precious stones in the book of Revelation. And while I was busy walking in the street, and I, I didn't know what to do. The next moment, I heard a voice behind me. And this, this voice called my name. He, he, he spoke to me. He said, what are you doing here? And all I remember was this. I said, I'm looking for Jesus, but I, don't, I can't find him. But as he mentioned my name, the second time he spoke, he said, I, I said, but this, this name, this, this being, that's, this person speaking to me, this is a voice I'm so familiar with. It is the voice of Jesus. And as he spoke to me like that, I broke. I started to cry. I said, God, I, I've, I've come into your presence. I, please don't, 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 say, don't allow me to go back. And it was at that point where I pleaded with him. I said, Jesus, I've arrived here. Don't, I don't want to go back. I said, Henny, I'm allowing this to happen to you because the road that is ahead of you is going to be difficult. And you're not going to make it. But throughout your life, when you do face difficult times, you will always remember this. And that is what I would like to encourage you with is that as believers, you know, in the word of God, God speak about this in the book of, of Ephesians. In the, I think it's Ephesians 2.20, 3.20. which speaks about according to the power that worketh in us in proportion to that. It's, it's for us. We can decide how much of God you want. The decision is yours. But for me, at that point of time, when Jesus spoke to me like this, he said, you must go back. And you'll always remember this day. I remember I came back and I could see myself there by the side of my bed. And I came back again there. And that is how the way I started. I've never forgotten that. Because that has sustained me throughout my life. That is like... 45 years ago. And it has helped me a lot, but just something that really just helped me since then is that there are a couple of things that, uh, especially as young people, um, we've also gone that route, but there are three things, and I've got three little slides here. I'd like to show you one. Maybe the, if we don't mind to get that first slide up, um, yeah, with the Bible. Shepherd, can we just put up that one of the Bible? Yeah, that, that, that looks like an old law book or whatever, but that is not, it's, it's not. Um, the beginning of this year, I was on my way to Namibia, traveled by road, and I went through a little town called Griekwastad, um, on the, in the Northern Cape. And this little town is like a one, it's like, it, it's so, it is deserted, it is, it is run down, but right in the, almost like in the center of this little town, there's a little monument. And I went in there and it was all about a man by the name called William Moffat. Now William Moffat, was the father-in-law of David Livingston. And David Livingston also started in South Africa. But uh, he met his wife, um, and with, with that Bible, um, William Moffat came from the UK. And I thought to myself, as I looked at that Bible, 
what would cause a person to do what he did at the time? It was that word. And that word, you notice, it was used. It is a Bible. And for me, this Bible that you see here have sustained me. The Word of God have kept me through all these years. Sometimes the journey has been so difficult, so hard. But I could always get back into the Word of God. And that is what I would like to leave with you. Is that God wants us to understand that this Word that He's given us, there's nothing that can be compared with this. This is my life. This is really what it's all about. Now the second thing is, the second little slide, if you don't mind to put that one up, please. With the people standing. You see that? Uh, it's a, that photo is, that, that photo is, maybe a hundred years or at least old and uh, it's, it's, it's these are missionaries and I had the privilege to meet uh, the, the one of the it's a lady she and her husband they have relocated to uh, they've taken over the, the, the leadership of the church in Arari and uh, I spent time there at an, at an equip this year and she, they told me the story how that they, both of them are from German descent. And those missionaries, uh, the men, what happened was in Germany, they, they built a ship with wood. And that, that ship was to take missionaries all over the world. And in this particular case, it was to, it was to India. With all the building supplies where they were building mission stations and so on. And uh, what happened was, during that time, while they were there, uh, they, they were single men at the time. And they, uh, they sent message back to Germany to say that they, they are in need to find wives. And it, it is contrary to, to all, you know, marriage counseling and whatever. But what happened was, the message came, went back to to Germany and when he got back to Germany they made this announcement that these missionaries need wives and, and this is what happened the ladies that you see there you can count them how many there are they all answered to the call they were seeking God's face and they went to, to India and they how they treated I don't know but they selected their husbands. They got married. And the one couple that, you know, that I spoke with, that's, the, that's, that's her father and grandfather and mother. That's there. And uh, I really would like to just tell you, encourage you with this. With us, that's my wife, Rita there. She can stand up. Now, I, I've never, uh, my parents have given up hope that I would get married. So I, coming towards 30 and my mother, I've said, no, he's a lost case. He won't get married. And so, but what happened was I was in, at that point of time, a, a missionary. And uh, I did, I was away on a trip for three months, three weeks, and three days, uh, doing all the Northern Cape, Free State, and uh, around uh, some of the Transvaal at the time. And what happened was, the one night I was in Bethlehem, uh, Bethlehem in the Free State, not Bethlehem in the... <laughs> but in Bethlehem, and while I was there, I went to this meeting and came out from the, from the meeting, and I had a caravan and uh, I stayed in this caravan park. And uh, that night, it was in the middle of winter. It was cold. And I, uh, I just felt that uh, there's something wrong. 
And I went, took time, and I started to pray. And it was, it was late at night, and I just couldn't sleep. And it, into the early hours of the morning, I said, God, you must speak to me. I don't know what's wrong. I prayed about everything. And it was so clear. It's something that I didn't want to hear at the time. But God spoke to me and said, in 10 days from today, you're going to meet your wife. I thought, it, I battled the whole life to, like night just to hear that word, which I didn't want to hear. That in 10 days from now, you're going to meet your wife. And so, but from, from Bethlehem, I was on my way to a place called Witsisuk, which is also known as Kwakwa. And you now this is, this is for over 40 years ago. And we were still in South Africa. There was still the segregation. I, I thought to myself, we come from a background, my, my parents, and they were serving God, but they were still very conservative. I thought, now, what is going to happen to me? Here I'm coming into Vitsisuk, Kwakwa. And so that for the, long, for the next, what, nine days, Whenever people would come towards me, I greeted them like that. I didn't want to come close to anyone. Because, but I remember I, I was given a list of names, uh, you know, places that I need to v visit. And in this, this case, it was from there, I was on my way to a place called Rates. Now, Rates is a, it's a tiny little town. Never been to Rates in my life. And I remember I, it was now day 10. I haven't forgotten this. And I'm, I'm driving into rates. And as I drove in, I said, God, uh, God dropped this in my heart like this. And he said, there is a man here and his name is Johnny Kurtzen. You must go and find him. I thought, Johnny Kurtzen. <laughs> oh. and, but anyhow, I said, God, but where do I find this man? And in rates, the only, you know, this the thing that you can really work on, they've got these grain silos. And that's about the biggest place that you could go to. So I went there and I inquired. I said, is there anyone by the name called Johnny Kurtzen? And the first person I spoke to, he said to me, yes, there is a Johnny Kurtzen. He's over there. I went there and this Johnny Kurtzen had moved on to another place. I hunted him down for a couple of hours and eventually... I found this guy in the doctor's consulting room. And as I walked in there, he looked at me and said, I've been waiting for you the whole morning to come. You're staying at my place. Now, I'm single. It's middle of winter. Uh, you know, and as a young person, you're looking for food. <laughs> and I'm coming to stay at their place, and at least I'll have a place, to, a roof over my head. But that night, I went to the meeting. And I came back, and it was about 9 o'clock. And just at that point of time, as I I've, I've parked the caravan in, in their backyard, I came through the kitchen door, not through the front door, because I'm, at least I'm, I'm staying there now. I don't need to come through the front door. But just at that point of time, what happened was, Rita used to do the books for the AFM church. And she had to go to deliver some of the books and stuff to Johnny and Marty. And uh, so she was there. And as I came back from my meeting, I looked at this, I thought, it's nine o'clock. I've got three hours left. And the 10 days will be up. Maybe I, I didn't really understood what God was trying to say. I missed it. And, but I was really, I was so chuffed at myself. I'm, I'm, it's, it's not going to happen. But I remember, I walked in to that lounge. And as I walked in, there was Rita. And she sat in the corner of the, of the lounge. And God spoke to me and said, and there's your wife. <laughs> and I, I was so discouraged. I said, God, please. <laughs> I, honestly, I don't want a wife. But, but you know, I've got this wife. And anyhow, what happened was we, we uh, you know, I, I was on my way from, from, from Rates 
to a place called Heilbronn and from there to Heidelberg where we stayed. And uh, from there I was on my way to Malawi for a couple of months or weeks. I was out there. And, um, Rita said, Rita, Rita, Rita used to pray. She said, God, I don't want to go and look for us, but you must go and search for him and you must bring him here. Because if I go and look for us, but I'll make a mistake. And uh, to cut a long story short, uh, God reminded her of that while I was in Malawi because she wasn't too sure. Because I, 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 I came to her and I said to her, all right, you know, when I realized that this is really, this is what God wanted me to do. Now, please, guys, don't even try to do this. But this is what I did. When I realized that God is, this is a serious matter. This is going to be my wife. I thought, I want to test God and see whether it is really true. I, but Rita's parents, they, uh, we, the, the people that I stayed with, Johnny and Marty, they were on their way to go and see her parents in, Heil, in Heidelberg. And Johnny said, but you don't need to worry. You can stay here, and, uh, but you, you're going to eat with Rita's mom and dad, and they will give you food. And, but Rita didn't want really anything to do with me at the time. But I'm, I'm now going to Johnny and Bob to have with Rita's parents to eat there. And this one night, while I was there, after the meeting, I was there like, eating, and the parents excused themselves, and it was just Rita and myself sitting there by the, by the table. And I just felt, I'm going to do something to test to see whether God is really in this. I said, I'm going to ask her straight to go out with me. And I've only met her like twice. I've seen her. And I'm going out with her. I, I asked her the question. I said, I know what God has got for my life. I don't want to waste any time with you. I, I, I feel like I would like to ask you to go out with you. I thought, she's either going to club me or she's going to just, she will say yes. And she took the second choice. She looked at me and she said yes. And I was so discouraged again. <laughs> the more I say, try to do something, the more I'm getting into this, now I'm, I'm going out with a girl that I don't want. But fortunately, I left. I was on my way to Malawi. and I went. In Malawi, she wrote a letter to me. Um, in, the, in this letter, she said she's not too sure about this. But it was at that point of time, I, told, I wrote back to her. And I said, I'm coming back. Um, and if I don't hear from you, um, I'll take it that you, you know, you've moved on. And, but when... Uh, I arrived back home from uh, on the farm, and as I got out from the vehicle, the phone rang, and it was Rita. And she phoned to say, uh, God has spoken to her. She's coming to visit. And, you know, it was just incredible. And for us, I, I met her that August. We got engaged that December. I saw her maybe twice that next year. And the end of that, that next December, we got married. And we've been married for 42 years. And we've never had a fight. It is the wife of my youth. I've said to Rita, I said, you need to remember, God comes first. And then there's the call of God. And then it's going to be you. And if there's a family, it's going to be the family. And up until today, my wife has been supporting. She's been there. We've been running this race together. That's all that we could do. So I, I want to encourage you. With, when we hear from God, God has spoken to you. This is what we are doing here. This is not just a short-term thing. This is about eternity. And then the next little slide, the next little one that I'd like us to look at is uh, uh, this is the reason why I'm here with you guys today. Uh, I received this. Someone said it to me last week. I thought it would be good for us just to look at.
Now this, this is the, the, the next generation of people coming through. And uh, my heart is stirred when I see that. They haven't got what we've got. But for them, this is what it's all about. Up in Africa, there are places where churches have been planted with children. If it's the age of 12, it's old already. And they're planting churches. The gospel is going out. And uh, I was in Mutari the other day with an equip. And there were some ladies and they were sitting, young ladies sitting there. And I just felt, you know, I, was, we challenged, I challenged the young people. And as I looked at these two, I said, there's a call of God on their lives. They were so desperate. I just felt this. I went to the one and I spoke to the leader of the, the, the leader there and I said, this girl is going to be like a second Catherine Kuhlman. God is raising this one up. And it's our responsibility to see this next generation come through. I look at you guys and we want to be there for you. Because you, the next generation, we want to encourage you to run this race. You've got everything. We are, I'm into the fourth generation now. My parents serve God. My children, they, you know, I, I came to, you know, to, I met, we met up with Jesus. Our children, our son and daughter, he's in ministry. And he's now his son. The son's coming through. And just, I said to them the other day, I said, you guys will go so much further than we have been. You've got every opportunity to do that. And I would like to just encourage you with that. Don't lose heart. Grab and take hold of every opportunity. There's this life that you live, take it with all, with all your might. So maybe we can move on from there. Our next question is, in all of your travels, what is the most dangerous experience you've ever had in the nations? I've had, uh, I've had quite a few. Uh, I can't, you know, but there's been times, the one that I've, I've never forgotten, been a time when I was sentenced to death. We, uh, I was a missionary and uh, you know when, when, when God spoke to me first he said, he said I must go and work in Malawi I didn't know where Malawi was at the time but I went and I started preaching the gospel. I was in areas of war with them at the time, the bottom end of Malawi, Mozambique. But there was a time in Mozambique where uh, Mozambique, had, they were at war. There were two parties, Renamo and Frelimo. Frelimo is the, is the ruling party in Mozambique at the moment. And they were then at the time as well. And they had... Uh, there was only one way that you could get in to Malawi through Zimbabwe and you had to travel what they call through the, through the Ted Corridor which is about 300 kilometers from Mozambique, from Malawi we, to, from Malawi to, to Zimbabwe, this little road that you had to travel on but the Frelimo government had uh, they, they made a, you know they, there was some agreement with them in Zimbabwe that the Zimbabwe forces joined the war against Renamo. And the Zimbabwe forces protected this uh, corridor. So that was under their rule. So the first 150 k's from Zimbabwe, or the, the Zimbabwe border, to, uh, through to Malawi, uh, there's this river called the, Sheri, the Sambizi River. 
So you could travel by convoy with to up to there with uh, with the military, and they would protect us in the war uh, that that they were fighting. And as we would come, we came to the Zambezi River. And I had a dear friend of mine. There were two of us in our vehicle. And we would, we travelled up. We arrived at this border at, at the at the uh, at the river, and. Because it was a South African vehicle, the commanding officer at, at this Zambezi River, uh, what happened was the one convoy would leave Malawi and they would travel to the Zambezi and the other one from Zimbabwe traveled to Zambezi and they would just swap around and they would take the others with them. And so with this new commander from, coming from Malawi, when he, when he saw the vehicle, he uh, changed his attitude towards us and he started swearing at us, and he chased us away. And I said to this friend of mine, I said, listen, we've been traveling for days to get to Malawi. There's no way that we're going to turn back. Um, because he didn't want us to be in the convoy with us. He wouldn't look after us. So I said, well, if that's the case, i just find my own way to Malawi through the war. But there was another vehicle also from South Africa. There's only two vehicles. The rest were all trucks. And this other vehicle, the two people in this vehicle, they came and they said, listen, we, they overheard me talking to my friend. And they said, he said, don't you want us, can't we just travel with you? I said, well, if there's two vehicles, it's better than one. Uh, you, they, can, they can come behind us, which they did. We started to travel. Uh, we did about 30 kilometers. And we came into an escarpment. And as we came into this escarpment, uh, it was like a, a, a dirt road, that we, but it was the main road. And right in the bottom, the, the grass was very tall. And on the left-hand side, there was a vehicle, and it was still smoldering. And, and I, I remember I had to slow down, but I could see this... It was a military vehicle, and they had what they call, um, you know, armored glass. But it was all broken, and there was this piece of glass right in the grass next to, as I traveled through, not knowing that it was an ambush, because right in front of that, where the vehicle was, just a little bit further on, was a dead baboon. And they've just shot it, and the blood was still fresh. It was still, it was still running. And there was a red flag next to it. And I was fully aware of this, that this is an ambush. But not knowing that right there where this little piece of glass was, there were people, soldiers were waiting there, this contact. But I, I still opened the door of my vehicle while it was traveling. And I bent over and I grabbed this piece of glass. I thought this would be a good souvenir. And not knowing that they were just waiting for us. And, you know, we, we went through and we traveled for another, like, 30 kilometers. And we came to a little, the, it used to be a village, but it was all shot up. There were just the little bits and pieces remaining. And we were captured by about 30 of the Frelimo soldiers. And they kept us at gunpoint for about four hours. Like, you know, I could tell you exactly how many groups and everything. He said, okay. So we, we tried everything, and they wouldn't let us go. And just at the end of four hours, we could hear this, there's some noise. And the, in the, in the behind, as the noise came, were coming closer, it was the same commander. And as they stopped, the, the commander, when he saw me, he was furious. And we now prisoners of war. And they took us. To, a, to the military camp. We had to travel as prisoners behind his vehicle. And this friend of mine, was, they was, he was asked to, to remain in his car, and so the other passengers from the other vehicle. Only the two drivers were taken out, and we had to go, and we stood in front of a military court. And it was during this military court that we were accused. The first accusation was that uh, we've been collaborating with the enemy. And I, and the, the, the judge, who was also the commanding officer, he said, listen, 
uh, did you come across that baboon with the in the sea scorpion? That I said, yes, we, I did come across it. He said, how is it possible that you that you went through this ambush and they didn't attack you? I said, it's obvious. They were waiting for you, not for me. But it didn't help. And so this went on and I was like the, the prize, whatever, that they've hunted. I'm standing there and he was in contact with, because the corridor was uh, protected by Zimbabwe, he contacted Zimbabwe, uh, their, their superiors, and he said, listen, this is what's happening. They were, jo the officers in this court, they were laughing and joking, you know, with what's happened. And I could hear the conversation between the judge and his superiors. And he said, listen, this is what happened. I've got this We've, I've got this case with the two people who are here. Uh, what must I do with them? And the, the verdict came back. I could hear it. And he said to, to this judge, he said, you can execute them. You've done it before. And just as he said this, the man next to me he started to cry. And he said, you can't do that. I've got a wife and a family. And I looked at this, I thought, I've also got a wife and a family, but I'm not going to cry. <laughs> I, I looked at the sun, it was going down. And as it was going down, I said, God, you've been good to me. That picture of heaven came up. I said, God, I've run this race. I won't see, we've been, I went through the ambush, we, managed, we, we escaped that, they kept us for four hours at gunpoint, and now the third time this day, this is final. And this Africa sun started going down, and I said, I won't see that sun again. I'm going home. But just then, as I looked at this, the there was such a peace that gripped my heart. I was overwhelmed. And I started to laugh. <laughs> and everyone in this court was so quiet. The judge had his firearm on him. I thought he was going to pull it out and take a shortcut, kill me. Because at that point of time, the firing squad came out. They positioned themselves. They were standing there. There was this big wall, and we were going to be standing there by the wall, and they were going to execute us. And he, uh, he said to, he stopped everything. He said, don't you realize what's going to happen to you now? We're going to execute you. And I was so overwhelmed. I said, that's wonderful. I said, you know what? You can kill this body today, tonight. But the real me, you can't do anything to that. I'm going to be in the presence of Jesus tonight. And God gripped this man, his life. That he was, it's a hard, hard judge. And tears started to flow down his cheeks. And he said, I've executed many people. He said, but you are different. Tell me why. Here's all the, all the officers, and they sit there, they're all quiet. And I started sharing the gospel. And you know, we, at the end of all of this, after I shared the gospel, the case was dismissed. We were handed over our, our passports, and uh, my friend and the other, other guy, they were going to send them back to Zimbabwe where they were going to face a military trial or a civil trial uh, court. And uh, so we traveled up into Malawi. We were there for about two weeks, whatever. And we were right on top of Malawi. And he wasn't in a good place. He really battled. But I remember it was a Sunday evening. We traveled back, coming towards Blantyre. And he said to me, Hedy, listen, we, uh, the chance that we get back home, there's not much of a chance. Because we, we've got to get through the same thing again. Um, can't we just 
get back to Blam, try and pick up all the rest of our equipment and try and get through tonight. So we arrived in Blam, and that night we tried to get petrol, fuel for our vehicle, and they couldn't find fuel. The fuel had run out of the, out of the, the area. And I, I said to him, you know, we, uh, unfortunately, uh, if, we, you know, if, we, if we do travel through to, uh, to, uh, tonight, uh, he said, uh, you know, what's the use? You know, we, we might as well, you know, just face it. I looked at him and said, you know, it's obvious we can't get fuel. We'll have to wait. If we, if, uh, what's the difference? If God wants us, us to die tomorrow or to, today or tomorrow, it's no difference. If that is the case. So, but we waited. We found petrol that night. And we traveled through. So the Tuesday morning, we arrived there that during the course of the night. We arrived there. And it was uncomfortable that night. Because you could hear a lot of support vehicles coming in. And the next morning before sunrise, this convoy was on his way out again. And the same commander that... Uh, who executed, who was, who sent this to me, when he saw me, he started running towards me, and he was so overwhelmed. He was going to kiss me. He was so, so overwhelmed. Look, hey, two weeks ago, you sent this to me to death. Now you want to come and kiss me. And he said, you are so fortunate. Had you been here yesterday, the whole convoy was wiped out, and there were no survivors. And I stood there, and I said, God, you know, you are so faithful, so true. And uh, just then, I, I, said, I, said, I said to myself, I said, if, if God were to help us today, I'm going to live each day as if it's my last day. But this judge said then, he said, today I'm going to protect you. You're going to travel behind my vehicle. You know, that day we traveled through that. They didn't remove the bodies. We went through, and we arrived back home. And that experience I had of heaven, and this one, have made an impact on my life. Um, and I don't know whether we've got time for the next one. Yeah, let's move on. Yes, that's remarkable. I think we should maybe, should we maybe just jump to the last question? Yeah, the last one. Um, yeah, I just don't want to, just want to be sensitive time-wise. But um, the last question we've got is, what is your journey for faith, for provision and finance to travel and minister look like? Yeah, you know, we, right at the very beginning, the day when I, when Jesus came in, and I made that commitment. I realized that I've laid down my life. I don't, choices are not up to me anymore. Um, it, is, it is God who called me. It's his call, it's not my call. Um, I've got a little uh, autobiography. It's, it's also named after that. It's his call, my all. And that's what we have, the way that we've lived um, with Rita and myself, when I, when I met her, and we uh, came to the point where we, we were going to get married, I never told her what my salary was, because I think she would have had second thoughts. But we've lived my faith for maybe 20 years. First 20 years, there was no, no income. And God provided for us. Our children grew up like that. One thing I can tell you is that with our children, they are passionate about the things of God. God has been so, so good for us. I can tell you there's so many accounts that God came through for us in a financial way. And the last number of years, we've come back to that again. And I've looked back and I said, God, if this is what the journey looked like, it's the most precious thing to every day to depend on Him, to look up to Him for your provision. So I, I would like to just encourage you with that this afternoon, is that there's this life, 
what life that we've got that will soon be over. Only what we've built for Jesus, that's the only thing that will last. I pray that God will take you and He will thrust you into the area or the nations where He wants you to be. So. Yo, just want to go on a mission trip now and <laughs> hopefully not face a firing squad, but I know it'll be fine. <laughs> John Henny, yes, thank you so much for just sharing. And I wonder, could you pray for us just as we... Yeah, let's pray. Father, thank you for these men and women. Thank you for your hand on their lives. Father, may you just open their spiritual eyes and to see where they could be. Father, may this be the generation, when we refer to the nameless and the faceless, Father, may this be true of them. May they be people, Father, that is so desperate for you. Father, may they be people that you will take all over the world. Father, that you will place them in positions, high places, open doors where they will stand before kings and before presidents, they see God at work. Father, we thank you that you've called them. They belong to you. Lead them on, we pray. May they be overwhelmed by what you are doing. We worship you, our King. And we give you all the glory. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much, Amy. Yes, amazing. Awesome, guys. Yes, so, so, so stirred. And, yeah, I think it's, it's just incredible. From meeting your wife to facing firing squads, there's, there's not one ounce of your life that hasn't been lived through faith. And, yes, I think that's just inspiring. And, yeah, I'm sure we all want very, very, we want our own stories. <laughs> I, I would like to just encourage you. We, we do lots of... If you feel the call of God on your life and you haven't got a passport yet, shame on you. <laughs> really. Um, don't talk about the nations if you haven't made a move towards that end. And for those of you who do have passports, you can get yourself ready because we do a lot of trips up into Africa. We are planning to do a road trip to Malawi next year, and uh, trusting that, that you will be there. So it will be August next year. We're doing a big trip. So you're welcome to come. But we, we, we cover all through Africa. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, God spoke to me. And he said, before you're 50, you'll be throughout Africa with the gospel. And uh, so we've gone throughout the whole of Africa with this gospel. And at, at the age of 50, I stood in Cairo, and, and God spoke to me, and he said, from here on, you're moving to the Middle East. So it's just been incredible the way God has opened the Middle East for us with the gospel going out, and we, we actively involved these still. So, but you're welcome to come. Awesome. <laughs> Lovely, guys. Yo, a full, full, full weekend, and it's only Saturday. <laughs> but uh, yeah, thank you again, eh, Henny. And guys, don't don't just run away. We did not a lot of moments like this. Say hi to someone you don't know. There are a couple different churches represented, and yeah, be blessed. Have an incredible rest of the afternoon. Go and sleep hard. And yeah, awesome. <laughs>